the HD2600 XT and 8600 GTS. If you're familiar with these mid-range cards from 2007, you'd know that they don't exactly inspire gaming confidence. The fact is, due to notoriously dismal performance coming at a steep price tag, both of these cards didn't live up to the expectations that their higher-end siblings established. Today we're going to revisit the battle between these two mediocre mid-ranges and find out how they stack up over a decade and a half later. We'll start off with specs and the 2600 XT is the first card up. It's using the RV630 GPU fabbed on a 65 nanometer node and comes with a meager 120 stream processors and is clocked at 800 MHz. Memory wise we have the GDDR4 version here with a paltry 256 megabytes of it running at 1100 MHz on a 128 bit bus. This has memory bandwidth coming in at 35 gigabytes per second. The TDP is just 50 watts and as to be expected the card doesn't require external power. Next we have Nvidia's contender, the 8600 GTS. For G84, Nvidia opted to fab it on the older 80 nanometer node, which I'm sure is a factor in the GPU's larger size and higher power consumption compared to RV630. Anyhow, it has just 32 SPs and runs at 675 megahertz. It also only has 256 megabytes of memory, but it's GDDR3 clocked at 1 gigahertz, which is also running on a 128-bit bus making for 32 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. The TDP is reported to be 60 watts, although their card requires one 6-pin pet connector to keep it fed, sort of. Oddly enough, I was able to run my card without the 6-pin pet connector and it didn't seem to hit clock speeds or performance, but power consumption stayed the same, so yeah. With specs out of the way, let's get into a little background on these cards, as they played a much more interesting and important part in the market than you might think. Of course, we can't talk about early DX10 hardware without going back to November of 2006, which saw the release of Nvidia's legendary 8800 GTX and GTS. These two high-end offerings shook up the GPU world with their amazing performance and vast feature set thanks to using a unified shader architecture. Fast forward 6 months to May of 2007, and ATI releases their response in the form of the infamous 2900 XT. Now this card didn't make as much of a splash because the 8800 GTS dominated it in gaming performance and value, but it still offered a huge performance uplift over its predecessor and an ambitious feature set to boot. Both impressive things in their own right. This first generation of DX10 graphics cards showed that both companies could do some pretty amazing things with their unified shader architectures, and naturally value seekers expected well-performing mid-range offerings to follow them up soon. And as the story goes, Nvidia's mid-range card would come first by April of 2007 in the form of the 8600 GTS for a price of 199 USD. Now at the time it was a rather unimpressive card as in gaming it would match or fall behind price comparable last gen offerings like the 7950 GT and X1950 Pro. The worst part about the card though was actually Nvidia's own 8800 GTS 320. For around $70 to $100 more you'd get nearly double the performance in games which pretty much made the 8600 GTS a write off for budget gaming. Well, how about for HDPCs and media playback? The 8600 GTS did come with a new UVD which made it great for this, but lower end offerings in the stack also had this while being cheaper. This left the 8600 GTS at a very rough place, as for gaming it was outclassed by slightly more expensive options, and for multimedia it was beat out by slightly less expensive options. As a result, the card spent a lot of time in an uncomfortable middle ground that didn't have much of a place in the market. With Nvidia unable to provide something compelling for 199 USD, they pretty much gave ATI the perfect opportunity to undercut and provide a competent mainstream card at a good price. Well first off, their card wouldn't arrive until June of 2007 with the 2600 XT, but it did come at a lower price of 150 USD. So how did it do? Well to keep it short, the 2600 XT also didn't cut it, and actually found itself in a remarkably similar position to the 8600 GTS beat out in game performance by better value alternatives, and lower end options in ATI's own lineup having the same multimedia functionality for a better price. At this time, the 8600 GTS fell in price to 170 USD, but this didn't really change its situation. Both cards were still in no man's land. At this point, we're left with two unimpressive mainstream cards and one question. If you really couldn't fork over the extra cash for a GTS 320, which one would have been the better option for gaming? Well, I think it's about time we answer that. I settled on testing 8 games today, and these range from DX9 titles from 2005 all the way to later DX10 games up to 2013, so overall performance in most scenarios should be represented here. I opted to do all the testing at 720p as with only 256MB of VRAM, these cards just can't hold their own at higher resolutions like 1080p. For the setup we're using the standard 3770K testbed, and I'll throw in all the detailed specs as well as the graphics drivers used on screen. Without any further ado, let's now dig into some testing. The first game up is Fear. 
I completely maxed out the game at 720p with no AA and used the built-in benchmark to get my results. Here the 8600 GTS comes out on top with 66 frames per second on average. Now that's 27% faster than the 2600 XT which managed 52. Frame times were alright on the 8600 GTS but on the 2600 XT they were worse, as on it we see plenty of micro stutter in the second half of the benchmark. Overall it's a decent showing for the 8600 GTS. It's a little odd that the 2600 is falling behind so much here but we still have the rest of the suite to get through so it has a lot of chances to catch up. Next up is Devil May Cry 4, and I use the high settings in DX9 mode as with DX10 I experienced constant freezing on the 8600 GTS. Anyhow I used a 115 second run of the built in benchmark and the GTS leads here again with it putting down 82 FPS on average. Compared to fear the 8600's lead shrinks significantly as it's now only 9% faster. Surprisingly frame times look excellent on the 2600 XT but on the 8600 they aren't great by comparison, with loads of swings throughout my run. Despite it losing out in averages, this game definitely bodes a lot better for the 2600 XT. Quite the contrast to fear. The last DX9 game in the suite is Far Cry 2. Here I didn't go crazy with the settings as I just chose the medium preset with no AA and I used the ranch small benchmark for testing. The 8600 GTS still leads with 50 FPS, which is only 6% faster than the 2600 XT at 47. Frame times were very good for both cards, but the 8600 did have some issues with random hard stops during the benchmark. This odd behavior could be repeated every single run, but thankfully it would only happen a couple times and it wasn't too disruptive. Overall the cards are very closely matched in this game, which is good to see. Now let's enter the world of DX10 with Crisis. I selected the medium preset with texture set to low along with no AA. Here the 2600 XT edges out the 8600 GTS by the skin of its teeth with 36 FPS, which is only 3% faster than the GTS. Frame times were good on both cards, but they were ever so infinitesimally better on the 8600 GTS, with the 2600 experiencing a couple of small swings during the run. One thing to note is the slight difference between the frame time lengths, and this is because the built-in benchmark renders a fixed amount of frames, and since the game engine is tied to the frame rate in the benchmark, some setups will finish quicker or slower than others. Next up is Stalker Call of Pripyat. Here I use the low preset with no AA along with a built in benchmark to get these numbers. The A600 GTS puts down the hammer, leading the 2600 by 34% with 51 FPS. Now the frame times were pretty poor on both cards here as they seen moderate swings all over the place, which made for a really jittery experience. Now this game definitely tends to like the VRAM, so I'm assuming both cards were being held back by the puny frame buffer here, as neither delivered all that good of an experience even though I cranked things way down. F1 2012 is the next game up and I kinda went potato mode with the settings selecting 720p with the ultra low preset as even with the low options the game fully saturated our VRAM. Also for testing I used a 140 second run of the built in benchmark. The 2600 XT takes back the lead in this game with 67 FPS on average, now at 6% faster than the 8600 GTS which came in at 63. Frame times were pretty good on both cards here, around the beginning of the benchmark it's pretty rocky but it definitely picks up a lot towards the end. In addition, the 8600 experienced a bit of micro stutter during the whole run here, and it results in a pretty sizable discrepancy of around 20% in the 1% lows. Second to last game is Metro Last Light, and uh, I've seen faster flipbooks than this. Anyway, I use the built-in benchmark with a low preset and 4xAF. Surprisingly, the cards turn in exactly the same results for this game, and before you ask, yes, I did test this multiple times, and the results were the same every single time. Both cards pretty much fall flat on their faces here, with just 16 FPS on average. As to be expected, frame times were equally as poor on both cards, and in general it's just kind of a slideshow. There's not much that can be done to get playable results out of these cards here, other than turning down the resolution to 480p, so definitely recommend you pick up one of these cards if you're looking to play Mestro Last Light. And the last game we tested is Tomb Raider, and I used the low preset with no AA along with a quick run of the built-in benchmark. This time the A600 GTS leads with 37 frames per second on average, or 28% faster than the Radeon. Frame times were good on the A600, but things looked a lot more stuttery on the 2600 XT with quite a bit of stutter in the beginning and middle of the benchmark. It's not a bad showing for the A600 GTS, but it's a shame that the 2600 XT can't keep pace. This seems to be due to the drivers used, as the Catalyst 13.4 drivers perform better in this game, but I picked the older 11.2 drivers for testing because across the board they see better performance and compatibility. 
With the testing done, I added up all the numbers and averaged them all out, and overall the A600 GTS is 11% faster than the 2600 XT when it comes to average frame rate. Now this looks like a clear cut win for the A600, right? Well, when you factor in their prices at the time, the GTS would have been 13% more expensive, which means that these cards would have been equally as bad a buy at the time. Yikes. I was expecting one of these cards to clearly come out on top, but that just isn't the case here. Quite a surprise for sure. To round off today's testing, I measured total system power consumption with each of the cards using Unigen Heaven. I used a static scene to allow both cards to stabilize at their maximum temperature, which was 63 degrees Celsius for the 2600 XT and 77 degrees Celsius for the A600 GTS. Pretty toasty. Just keep in mind that as always, these are numbers taken directly from the wall and they do not factor in PSU efficiency. That being said, with the 2600 XT installed, the entire system consumed only 98 watts. And interestingly, the 8600 GTS is the pig of the two, with the system power consumption rising by 32% to 129 watts. This kind of difference makes sense though, as G84 is fabbed on the older 80 nanometer process, and the 2600 XT makes use of lower power GDDR4. Considering how close they perform though, it's pretty crazy that the 8600 GTS consumes as much power. Efficiency seems to be the ace up the 2600 XT's sleeve. As this video concludes, it's clear to see why these two cards didn't make the cut for mainstream gamers of the time. While both could deliver a playable experience in a lot of the games tested today, I also have the settings cranked way down in a lot of these games. And the fact is, these slow mid-ranges would be succeeded by cards that ran circles around them in a matter of months, namely the HD 3850 and 8800 GT 256MB. Those cards were offered for a similar launch price and were much, much faster. It really was insane how appealing that price range got by the end of 2007, with ATI and Nvidia finally bringing fast and affordable DX10 hardware to the masses. But I want to revisit one question. If you either didn't have the money for selling better or couldn't wait for the mainstream market to improve, which card would have been the better buy overall? Well, since price to performance ends up being a wash, it comes down to what features you were after. Honestly though, both cards were pretty evenly matched in this respect, and the only potentially large deal breaker is the 2600 XT's poor AA performance which is something the rest of the HT2000 series exhibits as well. However, I didn't show this here because like I mentioned, in a lot of these games they needed to have the settings cranked down a lot to deliver a playable experience, so enabling AA wouldn't have made much sense as it would exacerbate this already very timid performance. Even if this was something you were concerned about, the 2600 XT's low power consumption balances out this inherent disadvantage quite a bit. In conclusion, if you were seeking a card in this price range during mid-2007, you'd be better off steering well clear of these cards and either picking up something cheap from last gen like an X1950 Pro or 7950 GT, or waiting until ATI and Nvidia got their act together with mid-range DX10 hardware. They definitely weren't fast, but it was fun to test these cards in this suite of games and it made for an interesting comparison considering how closely they perform. When I make my mid-2000s GPU roundup video, I'm definitely adding them to the lineup, even if they'll be punching bags taken to the cleaners by a lot of the other cards. Anyhow, that about does it for this graphics card one-on-one. -on -one. I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.